Good day to everyone and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Paula Sullivan. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at UiPath and I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, everyone will be on mute during the presentation. The chat box is available if you'd like to send a message to the panel. Uh, there will be several polls throughout, so please make sure to participate. And the slides and recording will be made available after the presentation. Questions can be asked in the Q&A box and will be answered throughout the session. So um, please make sure during this session that you're putting your questions in and we will either answer them throughout or get to them after uh, we finish presentations and do some Q&A. At this point, I would like to turn things over to Brian Armstrong, the Manufacturing Advisor for Ashling Partners. Brian, over to you. Thank you, Paula, and welcome everyone to Changing the Future of Work for Manufacturing, a UiPath Ashling Partners joint occasion. Again, I'm Brian Armstrong, uh, Manufacturing Advisory for Ashling Partners. And Ashling Partners is singularly focused on process improvement and automation. You know, we bridge the gap between business and technology and harness automation as a competitive differentiator. UiPath provides the first, the world's first uh, platform for hyper automation with the purpose of accelerating human achievement. So to start things off, while I quickly move through the agenda, we've got to pull out there to gauge where your organization or business unit is currently in your intelligent automation journey. So please take a moment and uh, make your selection. Thank you, Paul, for putting that up. So we have a full agenda. I'll, I'll push this through while we're going doing through the poll. All right, I'll kick off with a start. The state of intelligent automation in manufacturing today. Sebastian Sutter, the global manufacturing lead for UiPath, is going to dive deeper into intelligent automation application. David Kroll is going to provide a practical use case demo today. And then we have our client spotlights, which I'm really looking forward to because each one of their stories provides nuggets of value that one, we can all learn from and two, can certainly save you time in your own intelligent automation journey. So in terms of who we have today, we've got Steve Sykes, Director of Operational Excellence at Dexcom, Daniel Hart, Director of Finance at NSK, Daniel Bosa and Greg Gray, both senior managers of RPA with Oshkosh Corporation. So thank you speakers and we really thank you in advance and really look forward to hearing those stories. So Brian, we've got the poll results. If uh, you'd like to review them or I can review the results. Absolutely, I can, I can take that. So it looks like the majority of us are between that working in product um, in progress in terms of the midst of testing and deployment and then scaling automation. So I appreciate your participation there. All right, so by the uh, by the end of this event, and I always like to highlight this piece to make sure that it's valuable for everyone, you should be able to gain a much greater clarity for use cases specific to manufacturing, have a clear understanding of your next stop, and then finally, know where to go next in terms of harnessing that accelerated achievement. So let's dive in here. All right, we just did our poll here. Okay, so if we take a look at our industry today, now, prior to 2016, if we're looking back, organizations were focused on very much task automation, you know, but there wasn't really a true focus on end-to-end -end automations where that value can be realized through end-to-end -end processes. 2017, 2018, RPA grew more and more into process automations. Now, if we fast forward to today, uh, terminology has even really been developed. So IA, interchangeable with hyper automation or that combination of RPA and AI but we're really focused on that business function to drive business outcomes. And we've developed beyond independent task automation and really beyond that silo effect that we typically see with manufacturing. And really what makes a good candidate for intelligent automation. And typically we're looking at five areas and this is always a real refreshing visual to really spark some initiatives. But we're, first we're looking for those manual time consuming tasks. Now for this community, that's going to be very much department wide. You know, for safety, you're going to look at safety reporting, going to EHS, quality documentation in terms of a QA, uh, supply chain communication, and then data reporting and finance. We're looking at multiple platform integrations. You know, RPA, for example, can really integrate from 
end to end across platforms. We're looking at high volume. So think supply chain transactions all the way through the product life cycle, whether that's internally or externally from receiving all the way through end user experience. And it could also include um, service and aftermarket if that's a variable in the business. We're also looking at where you need to pro provide a lot of quality control between systems, for example, and validations. And then finally, business rule driven processes that can be find step by step because that's really where automation can execute. Nothing more, nothing less. Now there are a lot more use cases and today we're gonna to see specifics in terms of manufacturing heat maps that provide a practical breakdown for this audience in particular. And those visuals again are very helpful in terms of sparking initiatives. When we look at the business benefits, we're looking at five things typically when we're automating the right use cases. You know, they typically experience significant productivity gains because that automation can work faster than a human and robots can work 24 seven in turn freeing up that human capital in terms of working on that next project or initiative. So, I mean, how often are we pushing back a project or an improvement due to tied up resources? And we're looking, because of those productivity gains, organizations in turn experience significant cost savings. You know, through various resources, we found that automation costs about a third of an offshore resource. Performing quality control and reducing risk through 100% validation versus that five to 10% because those QA processes potentially were manual. Maybe those were random quality measures. So think about what that could do for your quality control process today and today and really that impact later for your customer. Innovation, a number of organizations have been able to use IA to build and scale teams and increase flexibility. So today, again, we're gonna be able to see a use case where that innovation piece and that scalability piece is really highlighted. And with that last point here, 95% of employees would prefer to work on more value add activities as opposed to manual mundane tasks. Now that's fairly obvious, but what does that really mean? That, re that means higher employee engagement where they're really gonna add value to an organization. So if I really break that down for manufacturing, you know, a good engineer is hard to come by. So if we can transition their experience so that's a more value add and they're driving that, that means that they're gonna be engaged, drive value so that later they can be developed as a stronger leader, which makes a stronger, stronger company. And I think that's hurdling a very large obstacle that we see in manufacturing today. And really what we're talking about is turning what was once scarce into abundance. So on that people piece, I highlight that briefly, we're talking about leveraging people and then retaining talent. Data has always been scarce and automation can turn your data into quicker, higher quality, greater volume of an asset. And then time is probably that most scarce resource for all of us. However, we need to translate that, that into dollars. And we can turn that business unit, your department, into a lean, highly leveraged and fiercely productive machine. And we're gonna unpack that lean piece as well. And that brings us to a case for change in terms of for manufacturing. As we see more manufacturers adopt and engage with automations, we're seeing greater implementation of RPA, yes, but also machine learning, document understanding to make better and faster decisions. Having spent the majority of my career in various levels of manufacturing operations, I know that leadership creates that foundation for manufacturing operations. Leverage of people, data, and time determine your effectiveness and speed, but those are the resources we're talking about are scarce, they're stretched, and not all, all the time are they retained. Intelligent automation opens that door. Now, manufacturing is a heavy metrics-driven industry, as we all know. There's always that emphasis on improving the metrics. And that data is typically through lean practices, continuous improvement initiatives, Six Sigma TPS models. So regardless of the methodology, regardless of the company, regardless of where you are in the world, there's always that emphasis on improvement. Now, supporting those initiatives with CI systems takes a tremendous amount of time, tremendous amount of data, and a tremendous amount of process that are typically manual. Intelligent automation accelerates and supports these already time-tested manufacturing initiatives and methodologies. And it's not that people are being replaced by hyper-automation, hyper it's that the skills that they need are changing. That ability to think critically and strategically about how to best leverage intelligent automation to deliver those best outcomes. 
So instead of that manufacturing engineer spending hours and hours transferring over a bill of material between systems, you know, they can concentrate on, on a proactive plan to reduce cycle time. Instead of supply chain team reaching out to various vendors and communicating and then reordering, we can automate that process and they can replicate a standard of work procedure at a different plant. It's about leverage. It's about being task focused so we can not being task focused so we can work on continuous improvement initiatives, which is really the culture of manufacturing. So as we continue to see that rise of that digital factor, we see that convergence of digital lean. So Bain finds that while traditional lean typically produces a 15% reduction to key operational costs, digital lean adds 100% improvement on top of that for a 30% cost reduction. Utiliz utilizing those advanced analytics, machine learning, document understanding, and process mapping can assist those continuous improvement, those lean teams on making higher quality decisions. So why use some of these existing teams that we already have? Well, some of the most common roadblocks that we see with organizations bringing automations are loose or non-existent centers of excellence, and informal intake ideas or a lack of ideas, and the, and the dedication of manpower. Well, regardless of how you utilize these teams, a CI team, a lean team, a Six Sigma team, these are typically existing manpower with top level down support already that support metrics. And they typically embody the process improvement culture. So they can bring scalability and sustainability to your program. Now, if I dive deeper a little bit into the how, there are two concepts I like to really review here. And the first one is our four A's of Ashley. And Ashley uses a holistic approach in terms of helping organizations approach scalability with advisory, automation, analytics, and AI. So with advisory, we're doing that value engineering piece to identify and qualify automations that time to value and establish those ROI targets. Automation is self-explanatory. That's where we're actually providing that end-to-end -end solution, the solutions that are reusable and that are beyond just core RPA. With analytics, now this is the data is the core of every business process. Now they're derived from the capabilities such as process and task mining, real-time dashboards and natural language generation. And then AI, things such as document understanding, machine learning and NLP are subsets of AI and can definitely add, become part of your enterprise fabric. Now these four A's are supported by a horizontal teams of intelligent automation COA as a service, build as a service and MROC, which is our comprehensive service covering product upgrades, break fix and then enhancements. So if we take a minute to highlight that first vertical of advisory, you now COE is that critical component of long-term success. Now these are those assigned leaders that provide direction and vision for the automation program. That plan, build, run, and iterate. That process never stops. With value engineering, value engineering, we're looking for that art of the possible, recognizing process improvement opportunities. And here we're looking for KPI specific to your organization to move businesses forward. With industry subject matter experts, that's what we're doing here today. We're looking at manufacturing specific initiatives through that industry lens. You know, and we're fortunate enough today to look at those heat maps, demos specific to manufacturing, and then hear client stories. And I do wanna highlight that future of work change management piece. It's a conversation that does not happen nearly enough. So we need to talk about those new types of jobs that are getting created through automations, which require skill development, um, with skill development. So it was stated somewhere recently that automation is taking tasks, but it's creating careers. I think that's very accurate and very much empowering. This is about having that critical conversation the success of programs for our clients, training their people, and really getting their culture ready through that organizational change management piece. The second concept I wanted to highlight here is really on go big and driving growth and scale in manufacturing. So we need, to, we need executive sponsorship to really go high to solve big business problems. There's, there's never been a successful, meaningful automation program that an executive leader hasn't sponsored. Now, digital becomes even more powerful when it's leveraged by leaders who understand the many complex factors, factors that contribute to operational excellence. We need to go deep so we can truly calculate what good looks like, driving targeted business unit engagement and capturing those process metrics. 
Go wide is the focus for our COE to move businesses in a unit from business unit to business process. Then going long is that advisory function, once again, cultivating that multi-year roadmap and strategy with plan, run, measure, and improve across those people, process, and technology. So it's a really good time to ask what that main driver is for your intelligent automation program. So Paul, if you don't mind launching that, Paul, we can, and then we'll hear about Sebastian Sutter and application. We're getting quite a few answers coming in. Brian, we'll give it a few more seconds here. All right, folks, get your answer in. All right, so we're about halfway there when it comes to the priorities here. It looks like we've got cost savings on first, time savings, and then experience is actually that third piece on improving that customer employee service. So cost savings definitely wins out. Yep, all right. All right, Sebastian, on to you, sir. Okay, here we go. Can you can you hear me? Yes, sir. Perfect. So I do look forward um, for the joint presentation now. Um, what we want to do is we want to shed some light on um, the question of um, what is intelligent applications of automation? That's one piece. And then the other question is like, what is a manufacturing perspective for that one? Um, and with that regard, I want to highlight a couple of themes that we will see throughout the uh, presentation. So one is um, we will see and clients examples like from Oshkosh will be around like, what does it mean to really go beyond like general and administrative kind of automation? So that will be a big one. The other thing is there will be an ever more increasing tech intensity. Um, whereas clients will ask like, what do you have beyond just mere RPA and how does that all come together? So that's an interesting theme. And then as Brian, you already indicated, there's an ever more need for like guidance on focus and how to drive these savings. So um, I know that Ashling has a lot of like knowledge around benchmarks. I can give some hindsights when it comes to like heat maps. So super, super happy to share that one. And then the last thing is we want to make sure that whatever we come up with is not like just like use case kind of stuff, but that it really becomes relevant for our clients. That means we need to think about our customer journeys and how that is really geared towards specific users, so-called personas or initiatives. Um, so that is um, something that you want to um, take a closer look at. So with that, let's go one step into the actual presentation there. Oops. Um, and let's go into where the actual opportunity sits. Um, and what I wanted to share is a perspective of where we see different clients pulling us into like various kind of initiatives. So one of the things that we see is that especially in the automotive industry, there's a huge pull when it comes to automation. So we're currently running a couple of engagements with a huge auto OEM in Germany that is really thinking about how can we make life of our employees easier? So that's the, the case for change, Brian, that you refer to with the mundane tasks. Um, we have a super interesting um, study currently running with a camping co company where they really think about an end-to-end -end process that really leads towards their customers. So what they are looking for is like, how do I automate sales prices from procurement? And how do I link them all the way to like my actual sales prices that then I can negotiate with clients? So that's a huge um, automation stream that we are running there. Um, and it really goes across industry. So another example that I wanted to share is one of the leading semiconductor manufacturers worldwide being based in Taiwan. Um, so one of the things that they really did is they came toward to us and they said, would it be possible that we rethink our like semiconductor manufacturing sites and really bring automation to the heart of um, the production shop floor? So we are working with them from engineering all the way to like the actual semiconductor fabrication shop floor to make sure that tasks like 
maintenance shops, um, predictive indications on where the output is, that this is automated. Um, and another super interesting story is all about supply chain. So with one of the leading auto OEMs from Japan, we work across their supply chain all the way from procurement when it comes to like, how can we go from a tender to a contract? And that could be end-to-end -end automated or questions like, how could we go from like ordering something into paying the whole um, supply chain stream? And these are a couple of engagements that we run across the supply chain. And interestingly enough, it's not only just about like end-to-end -end processes, it's also about like actual products and services that you can offer. So um, with a leading um, consumer goods company within like white label and brown label goods, we run automations that really sit on top of the actual products so that you can interact with products and services and then start automating out of that. So that's just something on where we see clients asking us for different kind of automations. And the good thing is, if you think about that case for change that Brian indicated to, um, automation a couple of years ago used to be something where you would think about like FTE attrition play. So efficiencies that you could see in personnel and then try to like automate these tasks. The good um, news is that although this might still be a very important or attractive spin to your automation play, it goes far beyond that. So if we think about what we see with like clients achieving, then this comes really down to value that they consider key business value. So for the consumer goods company that I was referring to, we are deep into the question how we can significantly reduce inventory and help on that one or for the automotive company that I was referring to when it comes to like the supply chain, how does that enable them to reduce their operating costs, especially around the saving side on the procurement side? And for the semiconductor um, company that I was referring to, one of their main interests is that they wanna go to a zero defect fab. And for that zero defect fab, once you can really eliminate all the deviances that you have in the production process, then you can greatly increase the output. And that's just being some of the examples. And we did an interesting study with the World Economic Forum, McKinsey, that backs this up with some significant findings on value. Um, so what does that lead to? And I was already referring to that bigger theme. At the end of the day, what you will see is that in early days, it was all about this topic number five. So you were thinking about how can we automate in finance, in IT, in HR? So these kind of like GNA kind of functions. And that's still a big piece of where we see engagements with our clients. But depending on the industry, we are now being brought into topics like one, the R&D topic, where you really want to go deeper into how you develop products and how you offer these services. Or if you want to think about your supply chain and production, and you could see how that picture evolves, because at the end of the day, you will see more and more end-to-end -end automation. And I guess that's the important thing. You can, with automation, really cater to all these rooms of your house. Yeah? Um, maybe one last thing somewhere hidden at the bottom. More and more clients ask us for these so-called foundational services because they work on things like hybrid cloud structures, which is then an enablement to run automations on top of that. That's another huge pull that we see. And then interestingly enough, if you think about the bigger picture, it's not just we do some GNA and then it becomes R&D. No, it's something where we are really being pulled into entire like value chain. So what we see, and these are like two big um, paradigms almost, there is one thing where clients pull us into all the upstream engagements when it comes to like automate the integration of their suppliers. So that's a huge pull that we see. And that obviously goes down all the way of your supply chain and the value chain. And then the other thing is, if you think about that example of that consumer goods company, whereby you automate offerings of your products and services, then this is the other direction whereby you go downstream and you automate all the services that you have either to the next industrial value chain or to the actual end consumers. And that's something where we see that this overall picture where automation opportunity exists is, is really increasing and expanding as we talk. Um, with that, what I wanted to do is I want to take that story of where we see the actual 
intelligence automation piece. And I want to take them one level further down and really talk about some more um, application stories, including some more signals that we see. So from a signal perspective, I already highlighted the study that we did with the World Economic Forum. But the interesting thing, it goes further than that. So if you see signals like 60% of all clients do really consider to take robotic process automation as a means to address skill gaps. So that's really huge. And that's already being in there by 2023, so two years out from now. Same thing is for um, like how many tasks that are currently being manual and being manual being 29% manual by 2019. That goes to 71% and that's a huge jump. So you will see ever more like need for these kind of integrations. And then as Brian already said, you want to make sure, and that's the other theme, that you have a clear guidance on where you want to focus. And I didn't take like the whole heat map in there, but what we see more and more, and that is something that we greatly leverage with like Ashling partners to go deep there. We take the knowledge that we have from an outside-in perspective and, and all the studies that we do on the UI path side, we enrich that around like so-called heat maps, which then enables you to really focus on like the dark ember ones to go deeper into your supply chain or let's say into your automation operations kind of um, opportunities that you see. And that really helps you to drive your initiatives. And once you drive that initiative, and, and that's now the interesting thing, and that is a study that we did with Ashling Partners, it can go both ways. So on the, on the one hand side, as I already shared, you can go end to end on like an horizontal kind of play. Um, because every single company has today the challenge, it's not about Gene A, but it's all rooms of the house, so that's the left-hand side. And then on the other hand, if you really want to address savings and the opportunity, then you need, you need to go deep vertically and drive the opportunities as you see them. And you don't want to read the slides because unless you want to get eye cancer, but um, we have a lot of use cases that we'd be super happy to share these use cases would come in various verticals, so automotive, consumer goods, discrete and process industries, as well as in the various functions or lines of business that you are interested in. And um, with that, I wanted to at least highlight something that we did in the automotive area. So we were thinking along the lines of like, where is the value and how could you capture that? And what you see here is a little case study that we did um, where we captured the value out of like two automotive OEMs. So on the one hand side, it's a Korean player that we are working with. And what you can see there is how savings are tapped into in this phase or stage one and how this accelerates going forward, which is you, you more and more see like hours being saved and that is driven by the number of bots and the processes that you automate. And you can see nicely here that this becomes first like a decentralized kind of motion focusing on one line of business or focusing like on one function like GNA. And then it kind of spreads, it becomes a decentralized kind of efforts whereby you really go more and more into the different lines of business. And at the end of the day, and that's really the interesting thing, as you see with the Japanese player, this player from his side said he wants to have 10% RPA coverage across all lines of business in his entire company. And that's a pretty strong statement because once you get there, um, then you see the savings that come with that. And then therefore you will see more savings as the percentage of RPA coverage um, increases over time. And um, with that one, I want to wrap it up. Um, if you think that the session was worthwhile, I'm looking forward for um, Q&A. And otherwise, be free to like reach out if you want to have a discussion afterwards. And with that, Brian, back to you. All right, Sebastian, I'm just waiting for some questions here. Let's see here. All right, so could you expand, I've got this first one here. Could you expand on really, on how to start your automation journey? Um, yeah, so, super happy to, to do that one. I guess what we found out is the following thing. Typically, if you wanna start it, 
um, it's two things that you want to bear in mind. One is the best thing is really to start like bottom up. So don't wait for the huge big thing out there, but really take something where your employees guide you and they say, really, I, I have a problem there. I don't have the time for that. Or I do think if we can automate that, we could do different things. So you start bottom up and really hand it over to the various employees that you have. And once you do that and have first success, you would see that success breeds success and that gets the ball rolling. So that's one thing if you think like bottom up. But then on the other hand, um, you want to make sure that this is not a one man and his dog kind of show. And thereby, it's oftentimes helpful that you have like an envisioning kind of stage whereby you really bring in senior executives and these senior executives then set a common ground on what is the strategy, what is the value that they want to attach to that kind of initiative, what is the organization that they need to build up, because oftentimes you need to build up an organization that is able and ready to like roll and manage these kind of automations. And you see, and you need to think about technology from a bigger perspective. And you take this, you take it as an envision kind of first stage, and then you roll it up with the client in a real immersive kind of way, wherever you bring the outside with partners like Ashling, together with like, like technology providers like UiPath and the client and make it a joint effort because it needs to be the client flavor because unless you get that flavor, you don't get nowhere. Okay, appreciate, I appreciate that. And then I've got another one here for you on, uh, this is a common question, but traps to avoid. <laughs> okay, traps to avoid. I guess a couple of things that are kind of obvious, but nevertheless um, important. Um, one thing that we found is you need to make sure that you empower your employees so that they can really self-serve. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you are able to provide tools so that the employees have it on their desk so that they can work on their automations. And once they have an automation, they can publish it. That's a very powerful thing um, because unless you do that, um, it really becomes like a corporate initiatives. And then out of that comes an app that nobody wants to use. So empower and make sure that you like self-serve your, your employees. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is obviously, you need to do this and be cognizant of the savings targets that you have and like the overall ambitions that you have. So if you start on that automation, try to really find out what is the business imperative? Why do you do that kind of automation? So is it an attrition play? Is it that you want to like increase your operations performance, these kind of things? Oftentimes companies have running programs with like efficiencies that they want to like target. And you want to make sure that you attach your automation initiative to that, because otherwise it's like a floating piece that is not really aligned um, in your organization. And maybe a third last thing is, if you think about IT initiatives, they tend to be super long, really straining on resources and these kind of things. But this automation play is different. That means make sure that you don't boil the ocean, but rather jump on one case and then don't think in like years to roll it out, but just go in sprints. I've seen clients really addressing big problems, achieving meaningful results, and this being done in implementation sprints over days. Yeah? And I guess that's the other thing. Don't go for the long run, go for rapid results and drive that and evolve that as it goes. Yeah? So this will be cool. Do kind of obvious things around like, or three obvious things around traps to avoid. That's helpful. I know that our three client speakers today are going to highlight some of the uh, points you just made and even expand on a few of those. So thank you for that. I appreciate the time, sir. All right. So let's hit our last poll. Um, so if we could launch that, thank you very much. So this is the top challenge in scaling your automation program. And then we're going to uh, set up for our demo here in a moment. Ryan, it's Rick. Uh, while we're doing that poll, we did have another co question come in on financial planning and analysis. Um, so the uh, just wanted to address that to uh, to one of the questions. So uh, uh, for the uh, requester, we will have three customer panels that will highlight that. 
As well, following this session, we'll also be able to share some additional use cases that uh, will highlight financial planning analysis of those wins as well uh, in customer use cases. So thank you for the question. Anyone else has questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, sir. So top challenge, so results here. Uh, awareness and education is really that top challenge in scaling automation programs. So I feel that in the second piece here is technical skill sets. All right. Okay, and then in terms of, um, we're gonna set up David here in a moment, but I wanna really set the stage for that. So you know, we're always striving to really make communications very applicable and um, people, something that someone people can respond to, right? So, with, so let's look at supply chain or inventory manager a little bit deeper. Um, and I know one of the, the um, speakers we have today is gonna to dive deeper into that. Um, so this persona we probably all know from some level, you know, your inventory manager is responsible for inventory control programs, you know, document, documenting procedures, they're monitoring trends, analyzing issues, um, you know, recommending improvements. And they're also at the same time having to, to lead and develop their own team, right? Um, in terms of typical challenges, um, it's the management of inventory, it's, it's supply, supply chain management, and then managing all those systems be, between that production planning and that master scheduling, which um, changes uh, almost on a daily basis from time to time, depending on, on your value stream. And then from a task and activity standpoint, you know, depending on how that structure is built, um, there's doing shipping and receiving activities, inventory counts, whether that's daily or on an annual basis, material picks, et cetera. So this is a very, um, it's a very complex, very high paced uh, persona that also works across a number of departments um, up and down with the organization. So this is the example that um, David is gonna walk us through in terms of um, how this works, how, how automations can work across systems and really set up your organization for, for success on a persona or on a department that is a very high volume department. So David, I'm gonna give this to you, sir. And I look forward to your demo. Awesome, thanks, Brian. All right, can everyone see my screen and can everyone hear me okay? We've got you, David. Great, great. So, so, so first off, thank you, uh, Sebastian and Brian, for those for those fantastic deep insights. Uh, my name is David Kroll. I'm a lead solutions engineer here at. Ashling Partners, and it's really my job to give you a tour through the art of the possible around intelligent automation. I'm super excited uh, because today we're going to look at a live demo of kind of a plant shipping hub that I've put together for you today. Um, so real quick, um, we are uh, essentially, uh, we have this intelligent portal that helps assist the shipping team with processing and tracking their automations. Uh, the business may need to process different, process different shipping requests to ship items to and from uh, either other manufacturing plants, satellite offices, HQ, or other, um, needs the ability to submit new requests, uh, as well as their child sub items, um, as well as the ability to view and act upon submitted uh, active items as well. Um, the ability to import the data automatically from a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet to generate bulk requests is also uh, a key requirement as well. And I think Brian already covered this, but um, we are going to focus, just because we have 20 minutes today, we're gonna to focus our demonstration really around the shippers, the masters ceremonies, if you will, for managing um, all of the automations from the central interface. Um, but do understand uh, during this demo that any of these interfaces can be built out for virtually any role. Okay, so now on to the demo. All right, can everyone see my application okay? Yeah, I've got it, David. Okay, great. So let's jump right in. So here we are looking at uh, my portal landing page, uh, which is built for us in UiPath apps. I can see all sorts of key measures here on the on the left. And since RPA has the ability to, to interact with backend data, we can really surface that data forward into KPIs within our automation portals, which is really quite useful. And while these particular examples aren't directly connected to data for this particular demo, I wanted you to know that this is something we can easily do once the automation has been rolled out. 
Um, on the right hand side, we have different actions that our shipper can take around this automation. Um, and as you can see, you know, I can create requests, I can manage my master data, right? I can, I can import requests from a spreadsheet, expedite my requests, uh, export them, view all and, and others. So, so let's jump right in and say that we received a request as the shipper and we want to put it in manually. So I'm just going to come in here and click create a request. And what I want you to notice is over here on the right hand side, this is my UiPath assistant. And as I do different things within the app, the RPA is running on the background. And I've really brought this little window over so that you can see that RPA actually running and see how UiPath apps really acts as that central interface for interacting with the different automations that you need to bring in. Um, so when we go to create a new request, we get a few nice things up here at the top that really let us know how far we have to go to actually get this request submitted in. So I can clearly see that I need to create this request. I'm going to need to fill out some master record information here. I'm going to need to link some items to that request and then finally submit that in. But what's interesting is that the amount of steps that you might have to go through can obviously change based off of the data that you include in the actual request itself. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Maybe I have an urgent request and we need to ship cement floors to the German office. Okay. <clears throat> Let me clean that up a little bit. We put in our, our department charge code. We put in our PO number. And here um, we, we pick our, our delivery method, right? And so I'm gonna leave it as ground for now, but I am gonna change this because I wanna show you something that's coming. Um, but if I pick international, you can see that um, it's automatically going to include this export compliance step, right? And then we can even get a little cute with it and we can say, okay, well, if it's error, we can switch those icons. So it's very, very clear um, what type of uh, compliance we're gonna need to cover, whether that's you know going by ground, air, or sea. Um, we're going to leave this one as air for now, but I also want to show you that when we switch on and say, hey, there's actually going to be some hazardous items that we're shipping in this request. We can also add that hazmat review before it goes to the export compliance step. So again, this is really um, that, that connection of people with the processes so that they know um, where the request is going and what all the steps are going to be entailed and why those steps are going to be needed. So I'm going to go ahead here um, and I'm going to uh, uncheck hazardous items. And we're going to say that we're shipping from, uh, we're going to say plant one. And what's going to happen here is the job's going to run to actually get the address for plant one. And it should load that in right below the field. So this is pretty nice. I don't have to go in and, and find the address. I can just go in and pick it from a list. Um, and in this case, we'll go ahead and pick the German office. You'll see that operation will run again, bring in the German office's value, and we are good to go. And just so you know, that is all being stored. All the data that we're working with today is being stored in the UiPath data service, which is really a, a great place to store uh, data for your automations. But of course, the data can exist anywhere. It can be in a SQL database. It can be in a different system, right? And it's all about getting at the data um, and, and bringing it forward. So um, I'm going to go ahead and click to add items here. And what's going to happen is you'll see a kickoff on the right there it's actually going to kind of create that draft master record. And now we can start linking the different items to that record. So here, um, you know, I might need to look up a particular part number. Well, we know we need to sh ship the cement floors um, over to this, this, this office. So let's, let's go ahead and, and work on that. So I'm gonna put in the part number here, which is just 212. I'm gonna click this search box. That's gonna get the product for part number 212, which in this case is cement mix. Um, if, if we have a little bit more time to build this demo, we might also load in like the price for that particular item as well and, and preload that as well, um, but just bear with me here. Um, but of course we can come in and we can set in the, the unit value and the quantity. And of course we can do some, some basic calculations on that, change the currencies around. And of course, if we need to you know, check the, 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 the currencies and kind of compare them as far as you know, the exchange rates, we can do that through an API call as well so that you have the latest um, data on that conversion. Um, so I'm going to go ahead here and we're going to add this item. And you'll see that that item has been added to the request. And you'll also see total items added one. And if I click view all, that's going to bring up uh, my, uh, my list of items that are, that are attached to this request. 
so I can see both the product name as well as the number and the quantity assigned with that. And of course, if I want to change that or remove it, um, I can just do it from that interface. Um, let's go ahead and add one more item here. I'm just going to put in uh, item 213, which is going to be our cement spreader. All right, and then I'm just going to go ahead and put in some general items here and we'll add it in. This is great. We should have two items added to this request and now we're all set. So I'm going to go ahead and click finish and submit. That's going to kick off our final process here and awesome. Our request is on its way and we can also see that there's a step that's going to be coming after this, which is that export compliance stage. So again, having that track or that ability to really track where I am at in the process, what's coming next, that's all something we can bring in using UiPath apps. And, and, and one of the reasons why Ashling uh, Partners is such a big fan of using it. Um, so you can see we've received that request to process two items. Well, now what, right? What do we, what do, we do once we have those items in the system? Well, we know that was an urgent request, right? So let's, let's view all the requests and see what we have. So in here, I can see that my urgent request that I've just submitted is in the system. And from this uh, view all request screen, which shows me all submitted active requests, um, I can come in here and I can action it. And because it's urgent, we wanna escalate the status. So let's go ahead and just click this fast forward button. Uh, kind of interesting side note here, don't many of us wish we all had a fast forward button for our jobs, but uh, I digress. So I'll go ahead and click the fast forward button, which really here is just saying we want to increase the priority um, on this particular request. And you can see it's running that edit status job on the right. It's going to uh, apply the escalated status to that item. Um, and return it back. And so there's all sorts of things that we could do to connect with this. We could you know, send out emails to the relevant groups. We could change the priority of the list uh, item. Uh, we could you know, put it in a queue in another system to get an action faster. Just trying to get you thinking about how you might use a system like this. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just mark this item as shipped. Let's just say that we already got it done. So I click that mark shipped item. Um, and again, it edits, edits that status to, uh, to shift and that'll remove it from our list uh, so that we uh, don't have to look at it anymore. Uh, we don't need those eyesores. So let's go ahead and close that out. So, so now what happens if I have a ton of requests to put in and I don't wanna have to cycle through all those screens um, to, to, to enter the data into the system? Wouldn't it be nice if I could just take a spreadsheet of items and automatically import that and create shipping requests for each item? Uh, well, I'm excited to show you today that we have the capability to do that. So first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up my folder, um, and I have this shipping request master uh, Excel sheet in here. I'm just going to open it up briefly to show you what's inside. You can see we have two sheets. The first one is master requests. This is the master request that we are creating, that first page. Um, and then the request items, which you'll find are linked to the relevant master IDs um, here in the, in the document. Um, so again, we've got all this stuff uh, in here. It's all linked together. Um, and we are going to go ahead and import this. So if everything goes correctly on this, it should import five new items or five new requests, I'm sorry. And then uh, it looks like 11 uh, total child items. Um, before I run this job, I'm going to go back into my UiPath data service. And first, I'm going to close out Excel here real quick. I'm going to go to my data service. I'm going to go over to entities. And I'm going to go and I'm going to delete the data from the one that we just created because I don't want um, I don't want that to kind of conflict with what we're seeing uh, next. So let me just go ahead and do this real quick. Great. So the data has been removed from our system, and now we're going to go ahead and import those requests. So what this is going to do is it's actually going to look. Um, for all of the spreadsheets that are in this folder. It's going to loop through each one. It's going to process them. So if you had 20 spreadsheets in here, um, the, the result would be the same. It's still going to look through. It's going to find those. The important part here is that it, it's, it's, a, it's a static template. So this wouldn't work if you, know, you had a spreadsheet that, that people are changing the columns around or the data types and whatnot. Um, it would need to be a static format. But once you have it structured, then you can automate it. Um, so let's go ahead and see what that looks like. I'm going to go ahead and just click this button to import requests. 
And so this is going to bring up my next screen. It's going to say, okay, Dave, um, use, this, uh, use this screen to import requests and all of their child items automatically. And you can see that it's pointing at the particular folder, which I kind of cheated and I set it up for that for today's demo so I didn't have to modify uh, any more of the interface here. But of course, if you wanted to change that location, you could have it set to click the button, bring up a window. You know, you could either browse to that location or uh, enter it manually. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and say yes, import it from here. And when I click this button, I want you to keep an eye on this right hand side, because what's going to happen is it's actually going to take that spreadsheet out of the to do folder um, and it's going to move it to this process folder. So let's see it in action. There we can see the import job is starting. And I want you to compare this to the amount of time that it might take to create those records manually. It's already done. Five requests. 11 child items in what, five, 10 seconds at the most? Pretty cool. So let's go in and see what happens. So, oh, look, the spreadsheet's gone from my to-do folder. The robot grabbed it. It moved it over to the process folder, which is cool. So we'll close that out. We don't need it anymore. But now if everything worked correctly, I should be able to click view all requests and see all those, all those, uh, all those uh, requests that have been entered. So let's go ahead and click it and see what happens. Look at that. All of our requests are there. They've all been imported. You can see they've been marked as such, which is even, which is kind of nice. You know, this is just kind of a, a general pro tip is if, if you're ever importing records into a process or a system, you do want to mark them as imported in case there's any data issues. That way you know where to uh, focus any, uh, any, any, any bug fixing, right? Um, but in here, you know, I can do all sorts of things with these requests, you know, before we escalated. So, you know, maybe we escalate the, the third item in the list. Maybe we mark the first item as, you can see it returned back as escalated. Maybe we mark the first item shipped. And again, what this really shows is me almost being this air traffic controller that's able to interact with the different automations and the processes that I need to run when I need them to run. Um, yeah, and, and, so, and so basically kind of being able to go in there uh, and work with that information. And let's say one of these requests that, that, I, that I imported, oops, actually, you know what, that one, we don't need that one anymore. We need to withdraw that. I can just come in and click the X and I can mark that as withdrawn. So again, this is just kind of creating some different um, example ideas for you to see in terms of how you might be able to use UiPath apps, RPA, data service, all together to really deliver a full comprehensive end-to-end -end solution that's, that's not, that not only works, but it's also like fun to use and it's easy to use and it looks good. Um, I, think that's, I think that's key. Um, so anyway, uh, let me close out of this. And uh, the last thing that I, that I had to show you today was the ability to kind of manage the data. I want to show you the data um, behind these requests, because obviously we only saw the requests. We didn't see all the child items that were linked to them. So let me click this little button. That's going to open up our data service. I'm going to browse out to my shipping request, and you'll see in the data that we have our five requests, okay? And each one of these five requests has a unique identifier right next to it. Great. So what I want you to know is that in that spreadsheet, I don't know if you were paying attention, but the ID was like one or two or three, but we have since translated that into a globally unique identifier. That means we are never going to have a conflict with that number. Um, and, and this is just one of the advantages of using, of using RPA in general is that you can do all sorts of data manipulation and pre-processing to make sure that that is successful. Um, so I want you just to kind of pay attention to like maybe this first ID, this 867. That's all you have to remember is just 867. If I go back to uh, my shipping items, you'll see that I have 11 items in the request. And notice that I have a shipping request field with 867 because it is directly linked to that unique identifier. So not only did we, did we import all the child items, but we also linked them back and we used best practices to do it. Um, so with that said, um, that kind of concludes the, 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 the demo here. Um, but, uh, you know, what, what would you turn into an app? You know, do you have to do a ton of repeatable work or are you just looking for a way to make life easier, kind of be that, that master controller of your process and really get work done faster? Please let us know if you have any ideas for apps. We'd really be happy to discuss the possibilities with you.
And with that said, I'll open up for any questions at this time. And, and, and thanks for your attention. I know I'm keeping some of you from lunch. And we do have a couple questions here, David. So uh, the first one is, does the end user need the attended robot or unattended robot assistant while installed to interact with the apps as shown here? So um, it, it depends on the way that you build out uh, your application. In this particular scenario, um, I've used attended robots to, to call some of these backend processes, which is why you're seeing some of them show up um, here on the right-hand side. But you could absolutely set up an unattended automation um, to execute, um, I would say, anywhere between 40 to 60% of the processes that you would need to build at the application. There are going to be certain scenarios where it's a lot smarter to run an attended automation versus an unattended automation, and we'd be happy to, to guide you through what makes the most sense there. Okay, and then um, another question here. So why would a business user want to bypass an ERP or, or native business system? to complete the tasks? Yeah, so, so I think what it comes down to is you have a lot of different departments that are often all working in different systems. And so sure, you can, you can work in your system, but what happens when you have to go cross department and, and then work in their system? You know, so we like to think that all um, the organizations in the world are all working <laughs> you know, on the same systems, but from what I found in my experience is that it, it can be very disparate and the data can be can be fragmented. Um, and so what I really think um, RPA allows us to do is kind of um, bring all those systems together. And also, I mean, raise your hand if you love entering data into legacy SAP. I mean, I'd be really, really surprised, right? I mean, maybe there's some diehard, hardcore folks uh, among us, but um, you know, in my experience, that's not really a lot of fun to do. It's not fun to, to, to feel like you're boxing with the application. Um, to, to get data into it. And so what UiPath apps allows you to do is kind of create this, um, this, this uh, application surface that allows you to take the data that you're entering into it and submit it into all those disparate applications. So if you have you know, a SharePoint site for this and an SAP for this and you know, another system over here, or a database over here, or a custom app over here, we can have it all orchestrate from one single button push within the UiPath app or within the RPA execution itself, of course. I think this is a more specific question here too for you, David. Uh, mm -hmm. Can data service have files attached to each detail record? Yes. Yeah, data service supports files. They can be attached to each detail record, yeah. Um, the one thing that I know is missing right now from UiPath apps, but it is coming soon, is the ability to actually directly attach files onto the forms. Um, so that is something that, um, that I I'm very eagerly anticipating, but I know it's, it's right around the corner. Um, it, it's not a huge deal. In the meantime, as you can see, we can just work around that by, by telling it where on our computer we want it to look. All right, then a final question here. Um, in terms of like style, branding, and interface, you know, can you configure are UiPath apps configurable? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's super configurable. Um, we we have all sorts of, of different capabilities to modify the styles, the margins between the controls, the borders, the border shapes. You know, whether it's rounded, whether it's it's, it's more straight edged, um, the colors. You know, I tried to show a little bit of that today. Um, uh, so maybe if we go back here and just kind of take a look, but like you know, when I click. The create request, you know, I can make this blue, I can change the color of the buttons, the icons, all that good stuff. And I can kind of get it to line up with the step that we're on, right? Which is which is kind of nice. And so we have a lot of capability in terms of, of how we structure it out. Um, I think UiPath apps really gives you the power to react to what the business wants. Uh, that's one of my favorite parts of, of using the tool. And um, just a, a quick note, as of right now, you can't like inject your own <laughs> spreadsheet, like if you have like a, a brand spreadsheet, you can't inject that over top the solution. But if you're going that far, you're probably beyond like the low code app development space anyway. And I'll squeeze in one last one here. Uh, when to use Action Center for this? Yeah, so, so where I would use Action Center is, um, do you guys remember when we, when we submitted the request and it told us, okay, it's gonna go to hazmat review next or, or export and compliance next? That is where I would use Action Center. I would use Action Center when you need to involve 
a decision that needs to be made, a yes or a no, or maybe an exception, and route it accordingly. Um, and it is something I'll probably end up building into this demo uh, relatively soon to kind of complete the whole, the whole process itself. All right, thank you, David. All right, so we're at noon here. All right, the, the next stop here is really our, our customer stories, which I'm very excited for. So I've got that at 12.15 Eastern, 1.15 Central. So in just 15 minutes here, we'll, we'll hear our first story. Um, so don't go away, we'll be right back in just a few minutes. Okay. We're at that 12.15, mark, so we're gonna get started here. So um, again, we've got three customer spotlights here. These are really exciting um, storylines overall. Um, I think each one has some unique pieces, so please stick around. So the first one we have here, Steve, if you are there. Can you hear him, Steve? There we go. Good morning, Brian. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Well, if you don't mind, give us a little bit of background on Dexcom mm -hmm. and yourself, and then we're going to dive right into uh, your journey here. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, at Dexcom, our mission is empowering people to take control of their diabetes. And uh, you might have seen some of the commercials with Nick Jonas at the Super Bowl or more recently uh, about uh, how we uh, provide products to help, help patients uh, manage and control their diabetes more effectively. And at Dexcom, you know, it just reminds me of a story when I was growing up with my father. You know, he had diabetes and had to deal with uh, the dynamics uh, of managing that day to day in terms of diet, exercises, activity level. And there was a very limited capability to do that. But nowadays, you know, I can, I can have a, uh, uh, a sensor put on my body and I can look at my cell phone and actually read my glucose at any point in time of the day or night and set, have alarms uh, set off if I exceed, you know, certain parameters. So from a, from a Dexcom standpoint, it's a very fulfilling opportunity to work uh, for Dexcom and uh, we're excited about the products that we, uh, we deliver. And we're excited about the opportunity to share our uh, use case with you. Absolutely. So Brian, next please. All right. <clears throat> yeah, so, so tell us about that journey. I would love to hear more about this. this is a great storyline. Yeah, we had, uh, you know, last year we were on a different platform, frankly. Uh, we were operating uh, in, a, uh, in an environment that was limiting in terms of our capability. Um, reporting was weak. Uh, the application was very chunky to uh, maneuver around. And uh, although we had bots up and running, it had been a long slog to uh, get things stabilized. And we didn't see that platform being uh, the future of what we wanted to do at Dexcom, especially the fact that we have to manage to scale. So our strategy was we had an opportunity where we had 80% of the bots needed to be rebuilt. And that was because of a different platform change happening with one of our uh, big tech support uh, and uh, customer advocacy groups. So we took that opportunity to switch platforms, get on UiPath, and from there, we've never looked back. Um, and our strategy has really been focused on a three-pronged approach. We, we want to expand geographically. We want to expand organizationally across functions. And we want to act, expand technologically. So we're not just using the, uh, the replacement of transaction activity, but we're actually using the capability that was even demonstrated earlier uh, with the Action Center, attended bots, and so on. And so uh, from a quality control standpoint, the use case I'm going to share with you is called the Bot History Record, or LHR for short. Um, we embarked on a journey about a year and a half ago, uh, wanting to improve this process. Lots of volume of activity. Um, you're talking, you know, more than 10,000 times a year. Takes, you know, um, uh, pr uh, almost an hour and a half to complete and is a required, you know, step in the process before we can ever release product to the public. So 
uh, at what started out as a Lean Six Sigma project ended up as uh, an RPA initiative. And we took that on and said, let's, let's make this happen. Because, uh, you know, 38% of the process was administrative and involved more than five systems, uh, had more than 30 business rules. So you can kind of get a sense it was a high complexity build. Uh, once we did that, uh, we launched this process and we got about 75% of the process cycle time removed. And I'm talking about the initial, you know, 36 minutes of process time is now nine minutes. And the, uh, uh, the overall, you know, impact was getting rid of all of that administrative work and freeing up the resources to do more value added things. And you can imagine the impact to, to the team, you know, now we can, we can scale with it as we grow. Dexcom is growing about 20 to 30% per year. And as that volume increases, it's easy to increase the volume of the robots, the digital resources to account for that volume. So I, I'd say that the keys to success for us, um, again, is that helping to, you know, helping the business to scale. That's kind of our overall mission in the intelligent automation organization. And uh, um, we're well on our way and excited about what the future holds. Yeah, and, and on that last point, I know that you had put that well in a previous conversation. Just can you, can you talk more about what do you mean by helping you scale intelligently? So I think we talked about some you know, hiring practices and what does that mean? How do you frame that up? Yeah, you know, expanding you know, intelligently you know, our digital resource uh, pool. So right now you've got you know, some digital resources working you know, in the company and multiple functions. And, you know, the, the, the goal is to try to get more of those digital resources out there. Because you can imagine the pace of growth that's happening in our company and us just trying to manage that every day. And so um, the more we can bring on the digital resources to augment some of that uh, growth and, and easily expand with the volume of activity, you know, taking place, it's a much more cost effective and, um, you know, maintains the quality or increases the quality performance of the processes they're managing and uh, allows us to uh, scale very easily and intelligent, intelligently <laughs> um, uh, through that uh, whole growth, you know, cycle that we're going through. Okay, thank, that, very good. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, you talk about the Lean Six Sigma mm -hmm. or your CI group being integrated. Would you mind mm -hmm. touching on well, where, where do you control that? Because I know that's very unique to your business. And then mm -hmm. um, that progressive of that, progressive of that relationship, because I know that that changed at one point. Yeah, it certainly has changed. I think, uh, you know, there's, a, there's absolutely a critical need for Lean and Six Sigma in, in Dexcom. And um, we're leveraging that capability. And in fact, part of my organization, it's uh, consists of black belts in the community to uh, help drive you know, process improvement and lean out waste and uh, reduce variation. Um, the, uh, the beauty of that though, is with uh, the marriage of that with our intelligent automation group is that as projects are worked on and ideas come out from the problem solving, uh, you know, some of those solutions are robotic solutions that we can launch. And half of that effort is the business educating us on their processes and us educating the business back about what is the art of the possible and the capability with the technology. Okay, very good. And I think that you had also mentioned just where they were in that process of automation, right? I think they controlled some of that automation in terms of what- Yeah, I mean, through. it's, yeah, I mean, you know, the. Uh, originally, that was the case, but uh, we changed that and, and made it more of a, uh, a team effort between the two so right. that there wasn't, uh, uh, a, and it's important to note, you know, that the experts in the different spaces need to be, you know, controlling and managing what's coming in, you know, through the pipeline. We actually uh, launched Automation Hub to uh, manage our demand pipeline, and that actually started to help us govern more effectively the incoming uh, demand, 
the qualification and business case uh, framework that uh, uh, didn't exist before or was done through Excel spreadsheets. So, um, you know, the, I think the balance of business process improvement or continuous improvement, doing the initial problem solving and trying to get into the root causes of failures of uh, process execution, waste, variation, and out of that comes, you know, ideas for improvement. Um, those are, it's an, it's an easy putt. You know, when you right. when you take processes that have been looked at, lean, standardized, or at least gotten close to their, you know, standard uh, process that you can replicate that digitally and then launch it, and and then it's easy to scale. Absolutely. Um, so you made a platform switch. Can you yep. kind of tell me the the difference there? What you like about where you are now in terms of working with UI, UiPath applications and previously? Well, I mean, right out of the gate, I mean, there's there, there's really no cost differential overall between the platforms. So from that standpoint, you know, price wasn't an issue. Uh, there are obviously differences in the in the elements that uh, you know, if you match them up, uh, there's uh, little differences in price. But in terms of you know overall uh, cost, it's about the same. Um, and we were already able to take advantage of Automation Hub and integrate it to Tableau, which was a big problem with this platform before. Um, and now, you know, with uh, UiPath, we wanted to take advantage of Terraform where we can actually launch um, uh, robots in a matter of minutes to ca capitalize and take up uh, any of uh, any capacity constraints that we run up against. Um, we also were expanding, we wanted to in-house the resource capability uh, and expertise. So we uh, got a, we got, we hired in a team in Eastern Europe uh, to be our development team and uh, get, you know, migrate off of the outsourced or third party a vendor that was helping us. And the resources in that location were 10x more or a new iPath versus the other platform. So for us, that was an easy, easy uh, uh, putt. And then we expect the reporting to be so much better. Uh, we, we, we have visions about where we want our reporting to be. We already see the advantages uh, coming out of Insights and the integration with Tableau. And we know that we're gonna get a lot more uh, capability. And then lastly, we wanna capitalize on the technology quickly. So we're actively outside of just piping in our, our demand uh, of existing bot processes that we want to automate. We're also doing POCs with OCR and machine learning. We see a real promise about that. So our first ones are coming, uh, where our first build is going to happen here very shortly. Um, we're, we're using, you know, Automation Hub for recognition and reward. Uh, we, we're, we've got, uh, um, we're using the gamification capability in Automation Hub for, uh, uh, recognition for good ideas that translate into uh, um, bots that uh, you know impact the business positively, and then you know we look forward to. Uh, we also we have a task mining proof of concept running in Asia uh, with uh, multiple processes, trying to get visibility to how they're executed and see where the opportunities you know come out of the task mining tool, and then last we're we're looking at attended bots. Uh, citizen developer, process mining, we all have that in our heads in terms of where we want to be, uh, leveraging NLL for uh, email response and IVR and others. So you're definitely beyond, uh, expanding on uh, RPA pretty, pretty quickly because I think the uh, your journey, I mean, it's less than two years. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, to build on some of the things you just moment, mentioned there, uh, question here was with your launch of... Um, which, which are launch of automation, how does the company handle idea input? I think you touched on that a bit in terms of how you're generating mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Can you expand upon that a bit? Well, first off, we tried to move our governance structure from a, you know Excel spreadsheet framework to a more automated community-based solution. And Automation Hub kind of gives you that all that capability. So we you know, I had to, you know, set up the categories and, and elements to get uh, everything loaded in Automation Hub. And now we have, you know, regular governance reviews where we review the output 
of uh, the ideas that come in and push them through that whole assessment to a qualification stage to, to build. And then from that, we can hand it off to our build team and let them manage it, uh, those that uh, make it through that qualification stage. We see Automation Hub as really a, um, an idea, you know, uh, aggregator for um, uh, the your demand pipeline, a community interaction around those ideas they can share. And because we're a global company, it makes sense to uh, capitalize on that capability and build the community out across the globe so that everybody has kind of a shared interest. And uh, we have one process to you know, go through and manage the demand pipeline. That's very good. So obviously just expanding upon this question here, you open ideas up to multiple colleagues, multiple departments, and that goes without saying, it sounds like with your process. Yeah, and everything flows through Automation Hub. So we're, right. we're you know, putting on workshops, you know, ideation sessions. We're, um, we're encouraging, you know, folks from all across the business to come up with ideas. And I think being this recognition program we're getting ready to release will, will help incentivize that. That's wonderful. Um, another question here for you. Uh, what level of technical staffing do you need for that RPA support aspect of keeping everything running effectively? Well, you know, I'd say that's probably the strongest part of our group. Um, they've done a very nice job of managing the back back end support, and support really from a technical standpoint. You're going to need you know folks that uh, have uh, years of experience around the uh, platform uh, development and delivery, uh, and ability to get into you know existing bots that may have issues or concerns or changes that need to be made that they can actually manage um, uh, and uh, make those changes within, in our case, a two week sprint cycle. So, you know, it's gonna, you know, we have uh, broad expertise in that space. We use an outsource partner for that reason um, because we need it. And, uh, you know, over time that'll, that'll transition. But for now, you know, they're familiar with the processes we have operating and, and doing a good job. And then we use JIRA to use our to manage any of the uh, incoming uh, requests, whether they're change requests or issues that need to get corrected. Is that utilizing some of those testing tools as well? Yeah, I mean, depending on which department you're you're dealing with will determine how the level of testing and, and validation, but uh, uh, it's probably something my support team would be better, better positioned to explain right. further if I uh, uh, to say the least. So my last question that I think you touched on already was really on, um, what's next, but it sounds like there's a lot of momentum at Dexcom internationally um, in terms of mirroring and matching a bit of what you're, what you're doing already. We want to uh, you know, continue to expound this across the globe and across the geographies. Um, we, we feel like we, you know, we're getting exposed to the technology. Today's demonstration, for example, was a great demonstration of uh, the combination of technologies coming to play to ease, ease the burden of fumbling through Oracle or SAP or, you know, some of the ERP applications. Um, but, uh, you know, the other half of the story is we have to help the, the rest of the organization recognize where the opportunities are and task mining, you know, the uh, um, ideation workshops, other things right. to try to generate those ideas and, and get familiar with it is important part of our role. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Steve, very much. That was very informative. If there's any last minute questions here, but definitely appreciate your story. And um, we look forward to hearing a lot more soon. So thank you, Steve, appreciate that. Thanks, Brian. Okay, so moving on here. Uh, Mr. Hart, are you available, sir? There he is, there he is. Okay, so um, Daniel Hart. Um, NSK Americas, same same deal. Would you mind just telling me a little bit about NSK Americas and, and your role, and then we'll dive right into your story. Excellent, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, I, assume, I assume you can hear me okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so yeah, thanks for having me, um, and good afternoon. Um, yeah, so NSK, a little background. Uh, my name is Dan Hart. I'm the uh, Director of Finance for the Americas region. Uh, we are a uh, over 100-year-old uh, publicly traded Japanese-owned uh, company. 
uh, making motion and control products. Uh, product uh, products range from uh, automotive uh, type of products uh, such as wheel hubs, um, steering columns, water pump bearings, that sort of thing, uh, to industrial applications uh, in many industries: oil and gas, machine tool, ag agriculture, uh, medical, dental, paper, steel, etc. Um, so a very wide product offering. Um, we are the uh, largest pairing company in Japan uh, and top five globally in, uh, in the world, uh, hitting a, um, a milestone of 1 trillion yen of top line revenue in 2017. Um, just to, uh, before we get into our automation journey, uh, uh, we have a new CEO in, in Tokyo uh, and he has set a new vision for us and, and it's a change and go beyond, which I think uh, really ties in nicely to um, to our kind of innovation and, and automation journey that uh, that we've started off on. All right, well, and that's that's the uh, Vision Twenty Twenty Six, correct? That's what you're referring to. Uh, this is an offshoot. So uh, okay. yeah, we, we established Vision Twenty Twenty Six a number of years ago, uh, but basically, you know, really looking forward to the future. And the challenge is, um, you, you may not think there's a lot of technology shift in bearings and. Uh, that sort of thing, uh, maybe more so in uh, steering columns, but uh, as we move to electric uh, vehicles and that sort of thing. But uh, our, our CEO's challenge for us really is, is to look 100 years out. You know, what, where do we want to be uh, and be on the front end of that, providing solutions that society needs um, and taking a leadership role in providing quality product, products to our markets. All right. So let's look, let's look at your story. And we've, we've separated this in waves. That's really where it made the most sense in terms of where that dialogue went. But I, I'll let you take it away. Um, again, a very um, interesting story. And I believe you're the one that really brought this to uh, NSK overall. Uh, yeah, at least in the Americas. There, there are some, uh, right. some, some um, RPA kind of efforts uh, in other regions. But in the Americas, uh, yeah, our journey really started back in uh, to 2018. I was just attending a software conference um, for an unrelated uh, product, but uh, I, I sat in seminar after, after seminar, uh, talked about RPA and machine learning and AI and all these buzzwords. And uh, in one of the breakouts, I, I uh, talked with a, uh, the owner of a company who had developed um, uh, some software, some RPA software uh, specific to uh, processing account stable invoices. And I thought, you know, this is really is catching my eye. It's really interesting. And uh, it just so happened that we uh, kind of concurrently were going through an implementation of Oracle EBS, uh, and Oracle really introduced a lot of control uh, and uh, structure uh, that our, our previous ERP did not have. And so all of a sudden we had, we had a problem, uh, and that was uh, that we had to hire contractors in accounts table to supplement our staff uh, just to process invoices, quite literally to keep the lights on. Um, and so, so we did that, we brought in contractors, but um, with that as the backdrop, uh, then seeing that the, there was a solution out there that potentially could take some work out of the organization, uh, it, it seemed like a slam dunk. Uh, and so uh, I, I approached that with uh, our IT function and, and our uh, CFO, um, got funding for it. Uh, and uh, in fall of 2019, we, uh, we lost, launched our, uh, what we considered our, our pilot project uh, which was to automate our purchase order based accounts payable invoices. Um, and what we saw was that over time, once that was up and running, uh, we, we were able to reduce those contractor relationships, uh, which, which uh, in that particular case was, uh, was the drive, uh, not only to, to introduce RPA to NSK, but uh, the, the cost saving element, um, constant SGA pressure, particularly in, in the shared service. Uh, um, departments um you know we, we were really getting pushed and and contractors are not cheap so uh really allowed us to exit those relationships and and bet in a, a really solid uh, process along the way uh we, we had uh, great support um, from the it function um we, as i say as i said we established our center of excellence uh which meets regularly uh, not only to talk about um you know the analytics and outputs of uh, kind of how is the automation going how are the bots performing but also uh, talk about you know next steps what are we going to do um and, and report out we've got a great support system uh, with the it uh, function and, and our outside partners which in this case is ashley um so after, uh, after betting in our accounts payable PO-based uh, invoice automation, uh, we then looked to what we called wave two. And you know, we, we, we struggled with whether we kept uh, the, the next set of automation finance centric or, or whether we started to uh, tickle other parts of the organization. And 
a decision was made. Uh, we'd done some intake sessions with uh, IT. We'd done some intake sessions with uh, HR. Uh, and we decided to, to dip our toe uh, in the water uh, with some of those groups. And, and so with, within uh, human resources, uh, we built an automation to automate uh, the population of I-94 forms uh, for some of our uh, expats. Um, we uh, also looked at uh, an automation in our business planning and forecasting area uh, to um, give, them, give, give uh, them an opportunity to not do so many manual loads into uh, HFM for us and, and kind of empower uh, business people to, to do their own data loading, um, but have uh, mechanisms to check the data and make sure it was fit for purpose, et cetera. Um, and, and then um, finally, uh, we introduced an automation internal audit uh, looking at data, data analytics and, and um, kind of transactional detail. Uh, and and the, the interesting thing, I, I think, from wave two was that all three of those uh, kind of had a different end game. Uh, you know, for instance, in HR, it was purely the elimination of work. It was not a full-time job for someone, um, it, but it's an, it's an annoyance filling out uh, government forms over and over and over. Uh, and, and so we're able to eliminate that work and, and give that individual some of the time back. Um, in, uh, in the case of the internal audit automation, um, they are now able to look at transactions and do some data mining that they could not do previously. So in that case, it's enhancing our ability uh, to um, uh, you know, secure internal controls, uh, look at you know, oddball kind of transactions and dig into them and, and provide some additional uh, fraud alerts and that sort of thing to the organization. So uh, really interesting that the, the outcomes were all uh, really different. Uh, not all, you know, not in every case does RPA have to be a, an FTE reduction uh, play. Um, so here we are in, in wave three. We're, we're very much uh, right in the heat of wave three, I would say. Uh, and, and we're at a bit of a crossroads. So uh, I think, Brian, you in, in your presentation talked about uh, going long, going high, going deep, going wide. That, that, that really kind of rings with me because um, our, our new CFO uh, has indicated that he wants to put RPA quote on steroids. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, we're, we're looking at, and not RPA, I should say, he wants to put innovation on steroids. Uh, and, and so really what he means by that is, you know, beyond RPA, we want to continue the RPA journey, uh, but we, we have a, a company-wide, what we call innovation station, where uh, employees can submit ideas uh, for innovation. We have Cobots uh, being used in a number of our manufacturing facilities, um, AI and, and machine learning, and, and other uh, areas of uh, the IT group, um, and you know the, we, we want to bring these all together in a sensible way, in a way that is uh, coordinated in its effort uh, and its funding, uh, support models, uh, and that sort of thing. And so, while we're still developing that strategy and exactly what that's going to look like and who's going to participate in that sort of thing. Uh, we, we are continuing on with uh, actively developing uh, some automations. And, and now in this case, uh, we're, we're going uh, crossing the border and uh, introducing some automation in our IT group and uh, our uh, NSK Brazil organization. Uh, we're looking at um, some additional uh, automations in our tax function and our general ledger function, as well as an enhancement to uh, accounts payable to deal with some kind of low, low value uh, invoice uh, difference write-offs. Uh, again, just an activity that's you know, more or less an annoyance and takes up time and we'd like to exit it. So, um, you know, we're, we're pursuing these wave three opportunities uh, effectively in parallel with developing this greater strategy uh, around innovation more broadly. Uh, so it's a really exciting time. So I'm curious too, what was the, um, what was the change in terms of at your CEO level? I mean, that is a that's a major uh, objective of his. Like, do you know what tripped that trigger or like why that's such an important stand? Uh, so, I mean, SK, I think has always prided itself on quality products and, and being leaders in the market. Uh, and, and I think this is his view on that, um, is to come in and, and say, uh, look, we, we've put out a, a vision 2026, as you saw, uh, which kind of takes us through the next you know five years or so. but think beyond that, uh, think the bigger. Uh, he set a challenge to uh, be able to manufacture a net and neutral emission bearing. Uh, now you think about the, the bearing manufacturing process and if you've ever been a manufacturing facility, uh, they're, they're, you know, they can be dirty, they're greasy, they, uh, you know, we, we use all sorts of um, uh, you know, carbon-based uh, inputs to, uh, to produce uh, a, a metal object. Uh, and so that's quite the challenge that he set forth. But I think that it's his take on um, kind of you know, setting that future of, of motion uh, in, in play. Okay, and then um, 
on your keys to success, and I'm sure you wouldn't disagree that intelligent automation is going to help your business scale, but I think yours is more around you can't automate a broken process. So do you mind expanding on that and why that was so important? Absolutely. And then there's, you know, uh, if I'm being a bit cheeky, there's no greater example than our accounts payable purchase order based uh, invoice process automation. So, uh, you, you know, you cannot, you cannot, as you said, automate a broken process. Um, you know, my, my advice to anyone uh, endeavoring to uh, introduce RPA or any sort of, sort of automation is, is really to step back and analyze and understand your process before you try to automate it. So there's one thing RPA is really good at, and that's that's teasing out uh, where you have problems in the business process. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think one area of focus for us, uh, as an example, was in our receiving process. Of course, uh, these PO-based invoices, it's a three-way match, right? We have a purchase order, we have a receipt, and we, then we have the invoice. And the invoice can't be matched if there's no receipt. Uh, the invoice can't be matched if there's a difference in price or quantity. And of course, you, you know we have thresholds built into that, but um, but the bots only follow the script, uh, and they they are they're programmed certainly to deal with certain exceptions. Uh, but if a, if a receipt doesn't show up, uh, that invoice will never get processed, and so it then kicks out, and the human has to deal with it. Uh, and quite often, that that involves going back to the plant or the warehouse and and asking you know what happened to the receipt. Uh, and so that's an area, you know, had we, if we had to do it all over again, I think we would have probably spent a bit more time focusing on uh, some of the other players in the process, not just finance and, and accounts payable, uh, but the receiving function in, in, in our plants and warehouses. Uh, that's where we continue to see a number of kickouts. Uh, the, the good news, you know, the, the happy uh, part of the story is, of course, when you tease out where your issues are, then you can fix them. Uh, and holistically, then uh, we, we, we become more streamlined. All right, and then uh, uh, feel free to ask questions at this, at this time, but I've got a few of my own that I can get things started. So, like I said, you introduced um, NSK to intelligent automation. Can you touch on your approach on bringing that to the company? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, I mean, we really didn't have a any sort of global push um, uh, out of Japan to, to do this. Uh, it, was, it was more or less a kind of you know, skunk works project uh, with my return from this um, this user conference uh, and kind of talked to the interested parties and, and we agreed, uh, let's give it a shot. Um, so, uh, again, secured funding and, and put a team together, uh, partnered with uh, with Ashling and, and UiPath and um, and, you know, and off we went. Uh, so, um, you know, it, it really was truly a pilot. Uh, it was, you know, kind of, I, I got, I got a blank, not a blank check. I got a, uh, <laughs> I got a reasonably sized check to, uh, to, to go and try to make this happen and, and demonstrate its value uh, to the organization. And, um, you know, finance, there's a, a fair bit of pressure to do so. Um, and, and it's not 100% uh, successful. I, I, I would be uh, fooling myself to, to think that, but uh, but it was largely successful. We were able to exit those contractor relationships. That's the that's the proof in the pudding um, that, that it was a success to NSK. And um, and as I said, then off we went with Wave Two, and, and now Wave Three. And that was a large pilot. Pilot, if you don't, I mean, if I'm right, it's, it wasn't a small pilot. It was a pretty large undertaking. It was, um, you know, the, the the team involved was not so large. I mean, certainly, um, you know, doing, doing the business process mapping and um, trying to identify the major exceptions and, and um, you know, kind of tinker with the the settings and, and the way we wanted the, the bots to uh, to function. But yeah, it wasn't just uh, RPA. We, we also had an element of OCR with uh, leveraging Abby to do character recognition off the invoices. Um, and there's a, one of the bots scans uh, an AP uh, in, inbox, email inbox, uh, and reads those documents and decides what's an invoice and what's not. Uh, and, but we had really good partners, as I said, um, you know, both external and, and internal within uh, not just finance, but our IT function to, uh, to get it built. And that, that's another really good example of not just starting with core RPA, but expanding beyond right away. Um, so looking at that pilot, uh, are there things that you would do differently looking back at that? I'm sure there are, but I mean, can you touch enough to do those? Yeah, I mean, again, I, I think, um, you know, we, we probably would have, uh, we, we spent an awful lot of time focusing on uh, what did the AP uh, people do? You know, what, what was their process? Uh, and I think we did a really good job uh, of automating that. What, what we could have done better, I think, is looking at the other, uh, the other people involved in the end to end. And again, uh, whether it was from uh, the issuance of the purchase order uh, to the receipt uh, of the goods or services, uh, wherever that may happen. 
um, and, and understanding um, why we had issues with those processes before we tried to automate them uh, probably would be uh, the thing that uh, I would say we, we'd be most interested in revisiting. Uh, and it's something that to this day uh, we, we revisit. We get very good analytics on a monthly basis uh, from our IT group on, on how the bots are performing and all sorts of different error kickouts and, and why things, uh, why invoices did not straight through process. Uh, and that becomes uh, our roadmap. That becomes our kind of working list of, of tasks to, uh, to try to tackle to improve the straight through processing and, and make the bots as efficient as possible. And I've got a question from the community here. So moving from pilot to scalability, what changes did you have to make in your technical environment, if any? Ooh, well, I, I think a couple of my technical folks are on this call, but they can't speak to answer the question. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, again, we, we have really good partners. We, uh, we leverage uh, the MROC within, uh, within Ashling uh, to provide support um, you know, behind the scenes, again, uh, our IT group is constantly monitoring bot, bot performance and, um, and that sort of thing. I will say that the, the wave two automations that, uh, that, that we took on, um, none of them were horribly overly complicated. They were kind of low to medium effort automations. Uh, we did not increase the number of bots uh, that we were employing uh, to, to introduce those uh, because we, we had a number of them uh, obviously introduced as part of our AP automation and there was room uh, in the, the bot schedules to handle these other automations, which are not necessarily daily activities. Uh, so they could be scheduled for other times. Of course, we all know that the bots don't sleep. They don't take vacation. They don't uh, take the weekends off. So, uh, you know, we can get a lot of output out of, uh, out of a handful of bots that um, would take, you know, multitude of people to, uh, to, to handle. Uh, so in terms of technical landscape, you know, I, I don't know that, um, Go, you know, growing from uh, our pilot to wave two uh, was substantially intrusive. Uh, that is one of the considerations we're thinking about as we contemplate wave three and the automations there. Some of those uh, are going to be more likely medium to, to medium high complexity. Uh, and I think, again, we'll, we'll continue to leverage the support we get from the MRAC uh, and uh, our, our partners, but um, we are going to have to think about uh, from a technology standpoint, what we need to do in terms of uh, growing that landscape. Thanks for taking that question on, Dan. I appreciate that. That does, does highlight, you know, the importance of MROC and how that is in the in your systems. Um, well, I appreciate it, Dan, very, very much. Uh, that's all the questions we have at the moment here. So um, thank you for the time, sir. And then we look forward to uh, hearing how Wave 3 went. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Okay, so our third and final uh, client speaker is, <clears throat> is next here with Oshkosh Corporation. So. Greg and uh, Danilo, are you, are you available here? Yes, I'm here. All right. Indeed, I am. All right. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, Good afternoon. So we'll, we'll do this. Okay. Yes, thank you. So we'll do this again. If you guys don't mind just giving us some background on um, Oshkosh Corporation, yourselves, and then we'll launch into to your journey. Sure. Uh, basically, uh, this is Greg. I've been with the company uh, about eight years, and... Uh, I think I would uh, maybe defer to Danilo on uh, who joined the company about a year and a half ago as to why he joined. And I think what he would tell you is we make really cool stuff, but uh, I'll, I'll let him tell you why. Cause I think that really speaks to uh, what it is we do. So Danilo, if you wanna uh, tell him why you joined the company and, and what attracted you to us uh, based on uh, our background and what it is we uh, manufacture. Yeah, and uh, yeah. looking back, I've been with the company for uh, 18 months now. And um, looking at all the product lines that we have and how we serve the community, right? We serve our heroes. And so all that's the purpose statement. So we do everything from defense and we just won recently the USPS contract. So we serve our country in several different ways. And that's something that really attracted me personally and a people first culture. And that's how we implement it also within our team, how we make an IP implementation in a people first culture. Uh, fulfilling the lives of our right partners, business partners, and the lives of our uh, teams as well in, in our digital technology team. All right, so let, let's, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's launch into uh, your story here for the Oshkosh Corporation. So again, about um, under two years of a journey, is that correct, Greg? That is correct. We started uh, actually with a pilot. Uh, it would have been in uh, about this time in 2019, uh, what had happened is uh, we had a, uh, a third party uh, partner uh, to the CIO 
uh, in other areas of, of uh, digital technology, and they started talking to him about uh, uh, about uh, intelligent automation. And uh, he, in turn, at the time, I was a, a business relationship manager for our corporate finance and treasury functions. He'd asked all the business relationship managers, hey, uh, do any of you have a, uh, a customer, a business customer that might want to pilot this? Uh, and uh, believe it or not, the only uh, uh, business faction that raised their hand happened to be corporate treasury. And so I... Uh, you know, not by choice necessarily, but more by happenstance, got involved in RPA uh, in that regard. So uh, we uh, we got a use case from our treasury department and uh, and ran with that, uh, implemented that, and I believe it was uh, right at the end of our fiscal year, which would have been end of September of 2019, and then decided, hey, uh, you know, there's, there's considerable value here, and uh, now we'd like to uh, open it up to the masses. Uh, so that's really when our, uh, I'll call it our marketing uh, started. And in order to do that, uh, what uh, we did was we put together a, uh, what we call productivity day uh, for the entire organization. And uh, so uh, uh, that included education on, on what uh, intelligent automation and RPA was, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, breakout sessions to, to more specifically hone in on on, uh, I'll call it the usual suspects or the areas of the organization uh, most likely to, to be able to utilize uh, RPA in a big way. And that happened to be finance, uh, HR, and supply chain. And as a follow-up to that, uh, what I did was, uh, and this is partnering with a, uh, a strategic uh, uh, outside partner we had, um, we did uh, road shows at our uh, business segments uh, and really honed in uh, more specifically on, on their uh, processes because, uh, believe it or not, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will chuckle about this, believe it or not, all of our business segments do not do business or manufacture or supply chain or anything the same way. Uh, so, so we wanted to focus on their specific pain points, and by going out and visiting their locations, uh, we were able to do that. And we got that done. It, was, it would have been early last year. Uh, it was right about the time the uh, the pandemic hit. And by the time the pandemic hit, we had a pipeline of, I believe it was 450 uh, opportunities. And that was from Productivity Day plus the road shows. Uh, so that really at that point uh, necessitated our building a team. And it was about that time we had brought Danilo in uh, and hit, had him, uh, had him uh, build his team. And uh, I think, uh, uh, from that point, I'll let Danilo talk here about the uh, uh, supply chain wins we got last year, as well as the uh, uh, business education he did. Uh, I think it's it's perfect for him to pick up the story there. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, just for some context, you can see in the in the point one that we had KLG McNeilus Pierce. In for our first year, we had our focus on have market penetration in bots deployed across all the segments, and we were successful on that in different segments and in different business areas, and then tying in directly to the supply chain uh, wings. Uh, during one of these roadshows at Pierce, one of the big cases identified were pass due POs uh, to suppliers. So if the suppliers pass due, what do we do with that? And basically we had um, over 14 people in our supply chain team reaching out to suppliers and following up them on a daily basis to identify what was going on, when they would receive it, updating the ERP back, uh, in, in making sure that they wouldn't have a critical shortage in the future. So once they, they learned about what RPA could do and how they had everything structured, that was a huge win in uh, one of our big first partners with the business and have been a great partner uh, to this date and with several different ideas. So where we started at was how we can automate this past to notification process, not only on sending them to the suppliers, but then loading that information that's coming back from the suppliers into the ERP so that we don't keep spamming suppliers, right? They start ignoring uh, your notifications. So we work with them. They were early adopter with us. They were our uh, POC case with the GPSC team, our supply chain team. And that was extremely successful. Uh, that went really well. The team was really excited about what they saw. And then, well, now we dealt with everything that's passed too. What happens next? Right. So the next uh, phase was we have the critical uh, 
in our case, the, the look ahead was the, the, the next uh, obvious step is uh, how do I make them not be late in the first place? And so they had another process that was now in the weekly basis uh, to check everything that's open their system and notify the suppliers, hey, these are your POs coming up in the next 45 days, right? Can you confirm, check, and, and let us know? And there's another process that will take several hours for several people weekly to go through and extract the data, validate it, and then send it to the suppliers to receive that feedback. And that uh, since we had done the past two POs, well, we could tackle and reutilize a lot of the pieces we've done. So it was an extremely fast turnaround for them. So it was even a quicker win <laughs> than the first one from their perspective. And then a third step was, uh, okay, now we know uh, what we have with the, the, the POs. We know what it's 45 days ahead. What about the ones that we send them and they don't even did not even acknowledge yet? So that was a slightly different place where we were tackled, uh, looking at our supplier portals. But uh, we gathered that information: how which POs and, and buyers and suppliers were not acknowledging their POs, and we implemented that notification process across. And yep, the very first day we get quite a few cases of suppliers uh, inquiring about POs that ha they had not received or didn't know about. So now we, we tackled all the way back to the source, the source and, and we continue that communication. Uh, our last step was, uh, what about our critical shortages, right? So pass two, if pass two was not stopping a line, our critical shortages, my line is stopped, stopped right now. I have a fire truck uh, into the, in our lot, waiting for a particular part. And that was a more cumbersome process, it wasn't just a notification. So we worked through and how we can uh, include that process, getting, gather the information that's needed and have that open communication back and forth with the suppliers via an automated process to, to enhance that over time. So basically from this one pass to notification process, we had the opportunity to work in multiple process with, within that GPSC project uh, teams. And what that led us to do that we are working on right now is uh, we have four different segments plus corporate. And that means that we basically support co four completely different companies. Our, our uh, DTs and our organizations are pretty much autonomous. So we are now porting those bots and solutions into the new seg into the other segments of course, each one runs, it might run a different ERP or a different process uh, or a different, slightly different process, but they have the same need. So that allows us to cross pollinate these bots and reutilize a good portion of what it did. So we can have a quick turnaround for them and still gather the 100% of the value in hours uh, that was for the original process. And so that, that, being... that, that use case that you're talking about too, it's really fairly simple. Is that correct? I mean, it's two that parts. That's correct. Right? It's, yes. it's data, and you can, and I'll let you speak to it, but it's a pretty simple process overall. Exactly, because it's basically, they already had the reporting coming out. What they would need to do is split and send as themselves to the suppliers so they could go have the communication. Uh, and we do some analysis on that data, but it's basically a data extract analysis and then notification to the supplier. So it's not a cumbersome process from an automation perspective, but it's an extremely time consuming process from a uh, individual, uh, especially across a, a large group. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could expand on that because that was a question before in terms of um, communications out of an ERP. Like why would you use this application instead of just pure ERP? And, you, and it's basically a time sucker basically, right? Yes, yeah, so uh, the ERP wouldn't have at that point, at least we had a 20 year old ERP in place that wouldn't have mm -hmm. the capability of extracting that data and send it the way that was needed, right? Or not in an easy way. So uh, since we had all the process already built on it in a, from a manual perspective, it was really simple for an RPA process. And also, although the, most of the data come from the ERP, we do have key points, right? Uh, that will come from manual inputs across the organization. I might have updates coming from different business areas that we incorporate in that reporting or we extract or include in that reporting that would can, could come to the supplier as well. So it's not a, a ERP only uh, input uh, format. It has some additional data points coming from other places where it, RPA is extremely flexible, right? Well, yeah, I can just read one more data source or, or one spreadsheet or one SQL database 
and combine that data and send a very up-to-date information to our suppliers and also load very up-to-date information from suppliers and from internal customers. Okay, very good. Um, and Greg, I don't know if, you, Daniela, if you want to take this or Greg, if you want to take it, um, but in terms of top-down support, I think there were some good points there in terms of the staffing that you needed. Greg, you're muted, so you're gonna to have to unmute, but um, I think there was, a, there was a good storyline there in terms of where you started, their expectation and what you actually needed. Yes, uh, well, first of all, as far as the, uh, the top-down uh, support goes, as I had mentioned earlier, this, uh, the initial uh, uh, the edict to, to try RPA and intelligent automation actually came from our, uh, our CIO. And um, uh, ultimately what happened is after uh, a few automations and some, uh, some traction, in particular, uh, what Danilo had described with our uh, uh, supply chain organization in particular last year, uh, you know, uh, trying to manage your supply chain through the pandemic, uh, this made its way uh, all the way up to our board of directors as well as to our CEO. Uh, so needless to say, uh, uh, innovation is being championed from the top down uh, you know, they, they clearly saw the value right away, and especially in a crisis uh, situation, uh, as opposed to this having to be a, 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 a grassroots type of uh, a movement in the organization. Um, and, and to that end, uh, it, was, it was fairly easy then for our CIO to get uh, uh, to double down on, on the investment uh, this year, just given the uh, results we had last year. Uh, initially, we started out with a team of uh, I believe it was three part-time uh, internal folks who who maybe knew how to spell RPA, but but knew nothing else about it. So it had to be trained, had to be uh, uh, acclimated to it, uh, as well as uh, uh, we got uh, some tutoring from, uh, thankfully, from a couple of uh, Ashland consultants uh, who had been there and done that, uh, which was which was immensely helpful to us to get going. And they really uh, were the ones who were able to to uh, 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 to build uh, a couple of bots in short order just because of their experience alongside our folks who they mentored. Um, uh, ultimately, then when it came to, to making the investment for our fiscal 21, uh, basically what we were able to do then is double the size of our, our team through uh, internal transfers, through those part-time people becoming full-time, and then just by doing some external hiring as well, as well as uh, uh, adding uh, additional consulting help too. So um, uh, but again, I think the key was the, uh, uh, you know, the, the folks at the top really seeing the value early on and, and the championing of that coming from, uh, uh, from the top down. And, and if you can do that and deliver, uh, and show the value, uh, you know, they're, they're more than willing to, uh, to double down like they did this year. Thanks, Greg. Um, so no, another point I think we had talked about last time was just, um, you know, can you talk to the uh, supply chain had a lot of success and there were, uh, there were a few things you said that made them successful, including um, some personas of their own. Would you mind touching on that, or that stickiness of, of their success? Danilo, you want to take that one? Yes. And one thing we, we definitely take is their engagement. Right, uh, we had several great partners, but the engagement we, we got from our GPSC, uh, our supply chain group was extremely high. And that allowed us to get the engagement from day one, working through the process, working through the, the challenges. And I'll say that uh, to this date, since year one, over 75% of the value that we deliver to the business in ours has been into our uh, supply chain organization. And uh, right, they, they're very aggressive in a good way and a very, very assertive and those partnerships. And that's something that for everyone in any, any stage of your journey, right? The, the, one, the number one thing that helps you speed process is repeating customers, right? You're repeating partners and working new process. The first one is always a little bit of learning, is a lot, not a little bit, but a lot of learning curve uh, from both sides. And once you get that, uh, project two, three, or four, even if it's completely unrelated to the first one, that group now uh, of people and your champion in your business side, and that's something that Greg leads with our uh, steering committee, uh, they know which questions to ask. And when the process is coming to uh, the delivery team, to the development team, uh, that's my team, 
it's really well defined. So that aggressiveness, that interest in uh, follow up is was really key on on us to keep that success and keep the fast pace. Because one of the, our key metrics is is time to market, right? And that depends on our knowledge, our team knowledge, and our business partner engagement uh, on the process as well to bring it sooner than later to to fruition. And Greg, you've mentioned in the past too that uh, I think you had said that most people underestimate the selling that they have to do internally to move these things forward. Now, obviously you did that a number of ways, um, but do you mind expanding on that point? Because I think that's a, it's a great piece where um, we've seen people stagger. Well, I think, yeah, I, I think it's a couple of things. Number one is um, <coughs> it's, uh, uh, it, it can be culture. Uh, I know one uh, department in particular uh, in our corporate function, uh, they had indicated to me, boy, uh, you know, we, I'm not sure how the troops are going to take this when we say we start automating, you know, 40% of the, uh, uh, the processes within our, our, our group because they're automatically going to think, well, geez, that must mean they're going to get rid of me. Um, so the marketing really needs to, to, to uh, just very straightforwardly address that and say, hey, look, um, we're looking to, uh, we see value in you uh, so far beyond uh, these mundane, uh, repetitive uh, uh, tasks that uh, we want to unleash your potential. Uh, and, and by taking these, these things off your plate that you do, uh, that'll allow us to do that. And of course, there, there can be some skepticism. Generally, there's not, but uh, uh, that, that's just something uh, that uh, you face from time to time. I think another interesting thing, though, too, um, and this was really a, uh, uh, a revelation uh, with our supply chain folks. We were doing a roadshow uh, at one of our segments, and uh, what we uh, came up with was uh, in, in calculating the value, we thought it would save each of their buyers four hours a day. And my uh, question to them was, well, geez, we're, we're automating half of your day. Uh, you know, it, it, then they said, we got another idea that we could probably automate another four hours per day. And I <laughs> said, well, okay, but then you're going to be out of a job or what are you going to do? And they said, no, 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 you don't understand, Greg. Uh, we work 12 to 14 hours a day right now, plus weekends. Right. And, and so when you, you look at it from we're improving quality of life for these people, uh, that was another uh, incredible story that we're able to share in other areas of the organization and say, hey, look, uh, you know, if you're working uh, uh, just crazy hours, uh, this will help uh, bring things back to, uh, uh, you know, to a, a work-life balance. And Greg, just to... to on that, right? Uh, we had one of our, uh, I'll call it meeting with our CEO, and he mentioned one of the RPA cases specifically uh, during COVID because, well, we are an essential business, uh, right, with, with several of our businesses, but not necessarily our suppliers. So our supply chain was chasing, literally chasing parts and suppliers all over to keep our business running. And a lot of these automations took their, freed up their time to actually be able to work on what was important to the business that was keeping the business running at that time. And that's not many places you get the, your, your CEO is spelling the exact work you do, right? And, and how, how high up that can be, especially in a time of crisis like, like we, we've been having for the last year, year and a half. It's great to hear that um, your team was highlighted by the CEO and discussions around 2020 and getting through that. And that, that's great that they, you get that exposure as well. So can you, um, Greg, Greg and Dylan, you guys talked about a little bit of that uh, development, right? So your first year you had a, you had a um, and you measure success in terms of hours automated. Sounds like the first year or so you hit that target. Um, you're, on, you're on pace to, I believe, double that for this year and a little bit more. But then there's a there's the next level, which is not just another doubling, but it's something else. Can you touch on that, please? Yeah, uh, what, what we're looking to do, I, I think our big question is, uh, you know, RPA to, to us and I know to a lot of companies uh, is a foundational uh, place to start with intelligent automation. So now what we want to do uh, next year is, uh, uh, OK, so what other technologies make sense here? Uh, and that's really, I think, going to be the focus for uh, uh, our fiscal 22 
is we will still have hours automated uh, goals uh, and such, but uh, uh, but we really want to do that, uh, accomplish that with uh, with multiple uh, intelligent automation technologies. So that's really uh, uh, the impetus is uh, is okay. What what are we going to be able to do beyond RPA? Because uh, you know, quite honestly, these uh, these big opportunities that we're we're finding and and in even sharing across our, our business uh, units. Um, don't grow on trees. And at some point, um, you know, we're, we're going to have to question, geez, you know, do, do we tackle these, these very small opportunities or is this where citizen development uh, comes into play? But, but beyond that, what are the opportunities beyond RPA? And, and that's really what we're, uh, uh, we're looking at next. And then Danilo, to if you want to add to that. Oh, yeah, to ahead. touch on that uh, um, citizen development piece. I know we talked about that briefly, but is there a plan there? Maybe that is a question for Danilo. Like, do you have a plan to develop internally or what does that look like? No, so our focus is still on the back office or assisted bots. We don't have any uh, short or medium term uh, plan on, on pinging onto system development. Uh, that, and that's been part of our strategy for the next couple of years. Also, one other thing I wanted to highlight is um, how, Basically, this year we are doing four times of what our target was last year, right? This year alone, we had, we doubled the, our delivery last year, and this year we got a target twice what we had last year. And how do we actually build a team to support that, right? So we had, as as Greg mentioned, uh, Ashley partnering with us, but also we we um, brought a lot of people from our business that had the knowledge of the business, have the contacts and people. And also people from the market that had the RPA experience. And we had this blend throughout this whole year that was a key to the success of, right? You can talk as much as you want about uh, how many bots and how fast you can deliver it uh, and how you bring more business. But if your end product's not good, <laughs> that stops really fast. And, and, and having a team that can deliver great quality and support great quality is also a key of success. Being that an internal team or uh, augmented team with external resources, uh, but building that team. And, and, and so you build, we built a very strong onboarding process or to someone coming from outside or for onboarding new team members in the team and uh, mentoring and so forth. So they can grow with us and with the organization and start delivering really fast. Um, I'll, I'll put another question here as we wrap up. Um, do you think that RPA technology is the future will eliminate 40 hours as a full-time job? No. <laughs> so I think that uh, RPA has the potential to eliminate all the unfulfilling uh, repetitive work. Uh, right. But I think, I think you touched on that a bit before too. I mean, yeah. like supply chain. Exactly. I mean, there's always something new in supply chain and Oshkosh Corporation is also one that's always building pretty quickly. So that frees up your resources to do something that's more impactful. Yeah. So do I want to grow with the great resources I have, right? And, and, and that's the opportunity for that. Can I take everything that's unfulfilling or that's repetitive from their day to day so they can focus on uh, what is meaningful to them as a person and to the company as a whole and deliver way more than what was delivered before and with a better quality is, is, is that threshold, right? If, if I spend 38 hours to build a report and two hours analyzing it, uh, what's the sense of that? If I can have a robot preparing the report for you and you do the, the brain work, the value added work and spend way more time analyzing and acting on the output outcomes of that, that's where we'll see the value. And that's where we want uh, our people to uh, thrive and grow. Great, well, thank you. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Very much appreciate that. Thank you for all the speakers. Um, that was, I think the lessons that we've learned here and sharing these experiences are, are just great. So thank you for that. So to wrap things up, um, just want to highlight forward, right? So um, forward is, is back here. It's only just a few short months away, uh, October 5th and 6th in uh, at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. Um, so it's an event. If you look at the, obviously you can go out to UiPath and you can look for the event there. I know that we'll also be sending that, that link out, but if you take a quick look, it's it's full of how-to sessions, innovation sessions, and a lot of really good impactful speakers, including some client speakers, possibly some, some of the people that are on here today. So reach out directly for more information, but definitely hope to see you there.
And then in terms of building this community out, um, reach out, you know, let's connect on LinkedIn, set up a phone call. Obviously there's, everyone has been touching base with people to uh, get here today. So once again, um, wonderful session, really pre appreciate the questions and the interaction. Um, and we really look forward to expanding more of these sessions in the future here. So once again, thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Appreciate that.